you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 2, I will probably be reading the Christmas story quite a bit. This is the Christmas season. Hallelujah. Amen. Christmas is around the corner. And, uh, and we rejoice because of Christmas coming. Some of us rejoice because 2021 is coming. But you'll probably hear me reading this passage of Scripture multiple times during this season. But I, I, I love it. I never, it never gets old to me. And I hope it's not just something that we hear, but I hope it's something that we're listening to so we can take it all in and try to grasp it and fully embrace it and understand it. But this is what it says. It says, at that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. And this was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all returned to their own ancestral towns to, be, to register for this census. And Joseph... Because he was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. And he traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. And he took with him Mary, his fiancée, who was now obviously pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for her to, be, to give delivered, for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her first child, a son, and she wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth the King James calls it swaddling clothes, and she laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. There was no room for them in the inn. And that night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. And suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them, and they were terrified. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. And suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. And when the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And they hurried to the village, and they found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. And after seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened, and what the angel had said to them about this child. And all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all of these things in her heart, and she thought about them often. And the shepherds went back to their flocks glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. For it was just as the angel had told them. This is such a beautiful scene. We have angels. We have shepherds. We have a stable. We have Mary and Joseph. And lastly, we have the baby Jesus wrapped in strips of cloth or wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. It's the nativity scene that we see every single year with the exception of the wise men that we just like to, who arrive later that we just like to throw into the scene to make it more beautiful. But it's such a beautiful picture, a perfect scene that all of us can easily envision because we've seen it so many times at Christmas. I was thinking about the, the little boy who was helping his mom unpack Christmas, uh, the nativity set for Christmas to set it up in her house. And he's going through, he's about four years old, and he's unwrapping this one that's in newspaper. And he says, oh, look, mom, it's a shepherd. Oh, look, mom, it's, it's a sheep. It's a camel. It's a wise man. It's an angel. It's Mary. It's Joseph. And finally, he gets to the piece that he's been so excited to find. And he unwraps it. And he goes, oh, look, 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 mom, I found him. Here's baby Jesus. He's in his car seat. Because sometimes that's how it looks like to a little kid. Listen, Christmas is such a special time of the year. And I say that because of what Christmas truly means and the reason why we celebrate it. Christmas is the celebration of God sending his son Jesus to be born into our world. It's about the infinite one becoming the we one and you and I getting to behold his glory. But so many times we get so caught up in the jingle bells and the ho-ho-hos that we forget or at least we fail to remember the wonder of what it is that we're actually celebrating. The word wonder means a cause of astonishment. 
It means to marvel at, or it's the quality of excitement or amazement. It's, it's something that's awesomely mysterious. It's new to one's experience. To wonder. To wonder. You see, where a little child gets so excited, and their eyes go really big when they see Christmas lights and Christmas trees, and the nativity says with the Mary and the Joseph and the baby Jesus, you and I as adults don't necessarily have those same feelings. Why? Because we become callous over time to the excitement and the marvel and the wonder of what Christmas means because we've experienced it again and again and again. I mean, just take, for instance, the, the nativity scene itself. And most of us will have a nativity set probably somewhere in our house or in our yard. It'll feature Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus, and we'll see it every single day. We'll drive by them and we'll think nothing of it. We'll say it's a beautiful display. But it's a description of God's Son entering into our humanity. And yet so many times when we pass by it, or we, or we pause even to look at it, it's nothing more than just what I said. It's a display for us to see, but not for us to feel. It's as if over time that we have forgotten how truly amazing it is that God would send His Son down and wrap Him in human flesh so He can make His home amongst us. He's our Emmanuel. He's God with us. And yet sometimes the wonder of it all has been lost to us. The wonder. And it's not an indictment against us because it's just reality. They say that familiarity breeds contempt. And because, and because we've seen the baby Jesus on display at Christmas so many times, the wonder of who he is and why he came is sometimes forgotten. We just see the display. We just see the nativity scene. And we look at it. But we don't feel it. For the next few weeks, I'm going to be talking about the wonder of Christmas. Just to remind us about the marvel of Jesus' birth, this gift of heaven, and what it truly means to all of us. And the first wonder I want to talk about is the wonder of God's infinite love. God's infinite love. Because that's what we find when we look at the baby in a manger. See, Jesus said to John in John 3, 16 to the, to the man Nicodemus, he said, for God so loved the world, or this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son. Christmas is about God's infinite love being poured out through the greatest gift this world would ever receive, his son Jesus. Why? So that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God so loved the world that he gave his son Jesus to each and every person, no matter who we are, without prejudice. It doesn't matter what color our skin is. It doesn't matter what language that we speak. It doesn't matter how much money we own or how much money we owe. God gave his son, wrapped him in a blanket of his infinite love, and he laid him in a manger for you and I to discover for ourselves how great and how awesome and how miraculous he truly is. Listen, friends, that God would love us that much. In spite of who we are and, and who are we, we're by nature selfish. We're by nature very corrupt, we're greedy, immoral, we're all of these things, and yet God sent his son, Jesus, wrapped him in the humanity out of his infinite love to bridge the gap so you and I can be reconciled back into him. Listen, there's no gift of love like the gift that we find in Jesus, and that's the wonder of it all. And daily we should marvel at it, that God would love us that much in spite of us. And yet how often in the context of everything that's happening in the month of December do we actually pause and think about God's love and what Jesus coming to this earth really means to us? You know what his coming means, at least for me? Jesus' coming means that God loved us so much that he was willing to invade the chaos and the brokenness of our lives in order to save us and rescue us from our sins. That God loved us so much. It means his coming is that God loved us so much that he was willing to invade the chaos and the brokenness of our lives in order to rescue us and save us from our sins. It's the greatest demonstration of God's infinite love in sending us Jesus. And we see it all the time. We see Jesus laying in a manger. We see it in the nativity scenes. We see it on the screen. But we see it, but we don't always feel it. The greatest act of infinite love. 
Author Max Licato, he tells a story about a rabbi's son who was having some emotional problems. And one day, out of the blue, this boy walks into their backyard, takes off all of his clothes, crouches down in the yard, and begins to gobble like a turkey. He didn't just do this for hours. He didn't just do this for days. He did this for weeks. Parents talking to him couldn't persuade him to come in. Counselors, they had counselors come, psychotherapists to come. Nothing could dissuade him. And for weeks, he sat out in the yard naked, gobbling like a turkey. A friend of the rabbis, walking through this with this friend, this boy's father, seeing the father's grief, knowing how he just wanted to do anything to help. So he went out to the yard and he's trying to talk to the boy and he's getting no response. And so finally he does the most unthinkable thing you can imagine. He goes out into the yard, takes off all of his own clothes and crouches down beside him and begins to gobble like a turkey with him. Days go by. Them in the yard together. And finally, the, the rabbi's friend looked at the little boy and he says, do you think that turkeys can wear shirts? And between gobbles, the boy nodded his head yes, and they both put on a shirt. A few more days went by. He said, do you think that turkeys can wear pants? He nodded yes. And they put on pants. And Max Licato said that in time, this friend of the rabbi redressed that boy. And eventually, the boy returned to normal. You know what that is? That's a story of love. That's what Christmas is all about. It's more than the birth of a special baby. It's more than shepherds coming and angels singing. It's God invading our world, stripping himself of his power and his dignity so he might die naked on a cross for you and me. See, that's the wonder of Christmas. It's God wrapping himself in his infinite love and coming so you and I can discover who he is and how much he loves each and every one of us. Heard about the pastor who was visiting a children's home that belonged to his denomination they were going to be having a time with gifts and Christmas carol singing and, and the opening presents. It was going to be a real special time. And one of the young boys, a little boy by the name of Tommy, all of a sudden he runs out of the room and runs, races up to his bedroom and he crawls underneath his bed. This pastor, not sure what was going on, decided he wanted to go up there and see what he could figure out. So he goes upstairs and he goes and he stands in the doorway of this little boy's room where he stayed and he, he began to speak to Tommy because that was his name. He said, Tommy, he says, don't you, don't you, don't you want to come out? He says, we're going to be opening gifts. There's a, there's a nice fire at the fireplace. The tree's all decorated and there's some gifts with your name on them. Don't you want to come out? We're going to be eating real soon. And Tommy doesn't make a sound. So he doesn't know what to do. So the pastor walks over and he, and he crouches beside his bed and kneels down beside him and he raises up the covers and there's little Tommy, eyes wet with tears, just looking straight up at him. He could have easily pulled Tommy out. He was eight years old, but he looked like he was five because of malnourishment early, early in his life. He could have yanked him out, but at that moment in time, Tommy didn't need that. What Tommy needed to experience was somebody that, he, that would love him and trust, you know, that he could have trust in and feel like he could belong with. So that pastor thought, i, I got to do something. So you know what he did? He got on the floor, and he crawled underneath the bed. I don't know if you any of those ever crawled underneath the bed. <laughs> I've done it. It's not easy. The older we get and the wider we get, the harder it becomes. But he got on the floor, and he crawled up underneath that bed, and now he's laying side by side with little Tommy. His face pressed onto the carpet. And again, he starts telling Tommy about the gifts, about the food, about how we're going to be singing Christmas carols, about family. And then he told him about the baby Jesus coming, wrapped in swallowing clothes, lying in a manger, and how it was God's gift of love so we could belong with him. 
And after he said everything he knew to say, he decided he would just lay there right beside him, not saying anything. And a few minutes went by, and all of a sudden, this pastor felt a little hand reach over and grab his hand. And he said to Tommy, Tommy, how about you and I crawl out of here? We have a little more space, and then we can go downstairs. And they crawled out. And this pastor said this. He says, as I slid out from underneath the bed, I experienced again the wonder of Christmas. Because for him, he said it was the reality that God had come into the darkness of our hiding place in order to woo us out by his love and presence into a world that was filled with his light so that we could believe and become. He says, that's the wonder of Christmas. God invaded our world. He figuratively crawled up underneath the bed, as it were, to comfort us and draw us out to himself. Listen, John, in the opening of his gospel, he says this. In the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. Verse 10, he came into the very world he created, but the world did not recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the word became human and made his home amongst us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. This this is Jesus that we're talking about. This is the figure in the nativity that's wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And John said, his light shined into the darkness and that light brought life to everyone who would believe and receive him. And he said, we have seen his glory. We have seen his glory. The glory of the Father's one and only Son who was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. That's the wonder of the baby in the manger. It's his infinite love. In fact, John would go over in the light right in his letter in 1 John chapter 4. He says, verse 9, God showed us how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. Then verse 10 it says, and this is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. What John is saying in these two verses is that God's gift in sending Jesus as a sacrifice for our sin was nothing less than the greatest act of love. His infinite love being poured out for anyone to receive. Why? So that you and I might have eternal life through him. We could literally say without reservation that in sending Jesus wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger, God was sending us all our one opportunity to fully experience what real life and love was all about. I'm talking about new life, eternal life, a freed life, a forgiven life that was made possible. Why? Because of God's unfailing, infinite love for us. That's the wonder of Christmas. That God would love us enough that he would be willing to invade the chaos and the brokenness of our world to rescue us from our sins. So here's the question. How do you respond to that kind of love? Have you ever thought about that? How do you respond to someone loving you so extravagantly? How do you act towards somebody that was to give you a gift that was so great in proportion to anything you could give. Heard about a lady recently, a waitress in the restaurant. Some of you may have heard recently, the bill was like $30, $60, whatever, and she got a tip for $2,000. How, how do you respond to that? If you're the waitress and you're busting the tables and you've been serving this person their, their water and their food and, and getting them the things that they need and all of a sudden you're just doing it hoping that you'll get a, a $10 tip, maybe a $5 tip or whatever and all of a sudden they give you $2,000. How do you respond? What do you say? How do you demonstrate appreciation? Listen, how do we respond to the fact that God loved us as much as he loves us? How do 
How do we respond in kind when his gift to us is so much greater than anything we could ever give him? I think we respond in this way. First, we simply accept him as Lord and Savior. That's first and foremost. And then we take the love that we have received in him and from him, and we share it with others. I think that's the only thing we can do. Paul said in, in Romans, I think, chapter 10, he says, it's the least that we can do. Chapter 12, it's the least that we can do. John 1 again, he says, but to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion, but by a birth that comes from God. We first accept him, and then we share him. See, Ephesians 2 says this, but God is so rich in mercy that he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace, his love, that we've been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace. He saved you by his love when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. We cannot come close to giving back to God what he's given to us. See, salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. Think about that. We are God's masterpiece, he says. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he has planned for us long ago. How do we respond to God's infinite love? It's first by receiving it for ourselves as Lord and Savior. And then we're to pass it on to others what we've received. We're to give to others what we've been given. We take the love of God that's been poured out on us. And we pour it out on others. But that's not always easy, is it? Especially at this time of year. You'd think that this would be the, the season of making everybody being cheery bright, you know? That everybody would just be nice at Christmas. But for whatever reason... Christmas has the ability to bring out the worst. I don't know if it's the traffic, the stress, the shopping, people feeling pressure to perform, or simply the overall business of everything combined. I don't really know what it is. But for whatever reason, Christmas has a way of turning the average person into, a, into an aggressive monster. Heard about the guy who bought his mother-in-law a cemetery plot for Christmas. He did. He bought his mother-in-law a cemetery plot for Christmas. The next year came around, and he didn't buy her nothing. And she wanted to know why. She says, why didn't you buy me nothing? He snapped back. He said, well, you hadn't used what I already got you. That's, that's bad, that's bad. That's bad. <laughs> I had the greatest mother-in-law in all the world. She's in heaven today, but I did. Christmas, sometimes, it brings out the worst in people. I don't know what it is. I mean, we've all experienced them. Listen, I'm, I'm, I can be guilty. I mean, you cut me off, I'm going to cut you off. People pushing and shoving, grumpy, cranky, grimy. I was in Lowe's yesterday. In Lowe's yesterday, buying something in Lowe's. And I'm standing in line. And you only got a couple lines open. And I hope this person's not here today. I'm standing in line. And I'm, I'm literally the next person that's going to be up there. But these people had a lot of stuff. And it was going to take them a while. And so a lady comes to open up another register right here to the left of me. And she looks at me and says, I'll take the next person in line. And I start walking that way. And here comes this other guy. And I say, hey, 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 no, 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 nobody. That's me, that's me. <laughs> and I'm, 
And I walk in, I'm walking to the car and Debbie looks at me and she says, you got to remember, you're a pastor. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times she has told me that. But it, listen, our flesh, our flesh takes over. And there's something about this time of year that makes us all a little bit on edge. <laughs> the wonder of Christmas is that God loved us so much that he willingly invaded the chaos and the brokenness of our world to save and rescue us from our sins. And now our responsibility in response to that love is first and foremost to receive him as Lord and Savior, but then to take him and share him with everybody we meet, regardless of how mean or rude that they act. And I, I'm telling you, it's not always easy. I'm, I'm preaching to myself. I preach to myself every week. But we receive God's love so generously. And God wants us to, to share it with others around us so that they too might experience the love of God, the infinite, amazing love of God that we've experienced. Pastor Tony Capolo, he tells a story about a friend of his who lives in Los Angeles who likes to go shopping every year in, in the Nordstrom uh, store that's over there in her part of L.A., very exclusive part of L.A. She doesn't really buy anything there she can't afford to, but she likes the ambience there, so she likes the music that's being played there, so she'll just meander to the store, so she takes a Nordstrom shopping bag, she fills it with tissue paper, and then she just walks around like she's shopping meanders all through the store, every level. But he said that she was on the top floor of that, of that department store where the most expensive dresses were at, just kind of enjoying the ambience, the beautiful music, and just looking around. But all of a sudden, the elevator opened, and out stepped a woman that you could look at and tell that she was a woman off the streets, a homeless lady. You could tell by the way she looked, the way she was dressed, and, and this lady was thinking to herself, security guards are going to come get her pretty quick because it's obvious that she can't afford to buy anything in the store and she has no business being on this floor. But instead of security guards coming to get her, all of a sudden she was shocked because a, 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 a stately sales lady walks up to that lady and says, can I help you, ma'am? And the lady says, I'm looking for a dress. And she said, well, will you come to the right store? And she took her over and she said, well, what kind of dress would you like? She said, I'm looking for a party dress. And so she took her to a rack of dresses. And this lady, a friend of uh, Dr. Campolo said, the, the dresses on this rack were basically starting at about $1,000 a piece. For 10 plus minutes, this, this, this sales lady is talking about this woman's complexion, what dresses might look good on her. And she says, before she knew it, she had picked up three dresses off of the rack. And she says, ma'am, if you'll come with me, we'll go to the dressing room and you can try them on. And they went back towards the dressing room. This lady that's watching all this happen, she goes to the dressing room herself just to see if she can hear something. She closes the door and she puts her ear up against the door to listen. And it was just a few minutes later, she heard the lady say, well, I don't think I'm going to buy a dress this year. And then she says, the most surprising thing I heard happened next. The saleswoman who had seen this lady, saw what she looked like, saw how she dressed, knew she couldn't afford it. She looked at her and she says, well, that's quite all right, ma'am. She says, here's my card. And she says, the next time you come in the store, it would be my honor and privilege to serve you again. And Dr. Campolo, he said this. This saleswoman did what all Christians should do. She treated, treated the, every person she met the way Jesus would treat them. With infinite dignity and unmerited love. Listen, the wonder of Christmas is that God would love us enough that he would come into our world where we're at and rescue us from our sin. Our response to that is that we should receive him for ourselves and then we're to share it with others at work, at school, at the grocery store, at the mall, 
at the basketball court, wherever we're at, we're to, we're to share Jesus because that's the wonder of it all, who he is. That he would love us that much. See, it's only through Jesus that we can have this new life. It's only through Jesus that we can have the eternal life and a forgiven life. It's only through Christ that we can find the love of God that transforms us, saves us, and forgives us, and redeems us. Again, John says, God showed us how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us. That's the wonder of it all. That's the wonder. That's the wonder. You see, we all see the nativity sets that we have. We'll see them when we drive down the road. We'll see them in our houses. We'll have a shepherd. We'll have sheep. Maybe a wise man. Maybe a camel, an angel. We'll have Mary and Joseph. But the centerpiece, or the main traction of all, what we're all directed towards, is that little baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. We should never fail to forget in looking at it. That this is not just some sweet, cuddly, cute little baby. This is our life. This is our joy. This is our peace. This is our freedom, our forgiven life. That we should never forget the wonder of what it is we're looking at. The wonder of it all. Reverend Zolly Smith, who spoke here a number of years ago, he said this when he was here. He said he left his place to come to our place, to take our place so we can go to his place because he loves us. In the midst of everything happening at Christmas time, and I'm not joking when I say people act differently. It's not the peace on earth and goodwill towards men. People act rough and gruff. Like I said, they become aggressive monsters sometimes. But that should not be us. We have received the greatest gift of infinite love in Jesus. We should be sharing that love with others. Don't lose the wonder of what this season is all about. The wonder. I remember our kids when they were growing up. And now they're all grown and all have kids of their own. But I remember our kids when they were small growing up in the house. Christmas morning was always such an exciting morning. And I'm talking about wonder. They would walk into the Christmas into the room where the Christmas tree was at, and they would go, <gasps> and their eyes would get so big, and smile would be so huge across their face, and they're looking at the gifts and they're trying to see which one is theirs. <gasps> and we had a season of that when they're certain ages, but in raising kids and you parents that have raise your kids, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. The older they got, the less the wonder. I want you to hear them because I'm making a point with this. Next thing you know, you're trying to wake them up to bring them down. When they were little, they, they were up crack of dawn waking you up and because and, they were ready. <gasps> and now, but now you're trying to get them to come down and they come nodding like down. Why? Because the wonder, the wonder had diminished. And I only say that this, we celebrate Jesus' birth year after year after year. And I'm always concerned that we'll forget the wonder of what we're celebrating. That we'll forget that it's the greatest act of love, the infinite love, unfailing love, that God would invade our world with His Son, wrap Him in humanity. Let's don't forget the wonder of who He is at Christmas. 
Let's don't forget the wonder of what we're celebrating. The baby wrapped in swaddling clothes that you have on display is the greatest act of love that God could have given. It's not that we loved him. He loved us. And he invaded our world. So when you go home today and you have, you have a nativity set or you're driving down the neighborhood and there's a nativity in your yard, don't think of it just as a display. Think about the wonder of what that represents. He loved us so much, he invaded our world to rescue us from our sins. And the only way to respond to that kind of love is that we surrender our heart and life to Him. And then we share that same kind of love to others. Amen. Will you stand together? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me just for a moment? I wonder today how many of us here would lift your hand and say, Pastor Larry, I don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. I'm not following after him. Maybe I have. Maybe I've just kind of drifted away. Maybe I've come cold and indifferent. But my, what I'm saying today in the raising of my own hand is I'm saying that I don't have a close personal relationship with Jesus. But I want to respond the way I should respond to that kind of love. I'm ready to surrender my heart and life. As they sang earlier, I give you my heart. I give you my, my yes, my time, my plans, my dreams. I surrender all. I'm ready to make that relationship with Jesus count, mean something. He loves me so much, I want to respond by giving my heart to him. Maybe it'll be a first time. Maybe it's just renewing what you did before, but whatever reason, you say, Pastor Larry, that's me. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, if that would be you, would you just simply slip your hand up and say, I'm ready. I'm ready today to do that. Would you slip your hand up just so I can see you pray for you? I saw you slip your hands up. I see you. God bless you. I see you. Amen. I see you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, thank you, Jesus. I see your hand. Who would join me in lifting my hands? Because I'm fixing to lift my hands. Just so you know, I'm about to lift my own hand. Who would join me in lifting your hand and say, Pastor Larry, I want God to help me to be a greater example of his love. That I, I won't let the rudeness and the chaos of what's going on in December Cause me to forget the love I've received. I want to be able to show love in return. The love of God. I see your hands. Would you join me in a prayer? Would you pray this prayer with me? Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for coming into our world. God, thank you for sending your son, wrapping him in flesh, so that we may know him. That he may die for our sins and give us new life. Today, Lord Jesus, in response to your love, I surrender my heart to you. I ask you to be my Lord and Savior. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, to redeem me and rescue me and save me. I receive you as my Lord. And Jesus, help me to show the love that you've given me to those around me. In spite of behavior, in spite of the stress, in spite of everything that happens, help me to demonstrate your love so that others too might experience who you are in their lives. Help me, Lord Jesus, never to forget the wonder of your amazing love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Can we lift our hands all over this room? In your own house, if you're at home watching online, can you just lift your hands? God, we love you. Jesus, we thank you for coming. God, we thank you for your amazing love and sending Jesus to us. God, help us to never forget the wonder of it all. The wonder of such amazing love. That Jesus, that you would come invade the darkness, invade the chaos and the brokenness of our world, that we might be rescued from our sin. God, help us to always respond to your love in the way you would have us respond. As Paul said, it's the least that we can do. 
that we would receive you and that we would walk with you. And God, that we would share and show your love to those around us. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Lord, I pray. We thank you, God. We thank you, Lord. We love you. We give you praise. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want to open up the altars. If you'd like to come and find a place of prayer, come and find a place to pray. As you're heading out the door, stop by our table, pick up one of those bags and help us with blessed families for Christmas dinner. God bless you. We love you. We love you. These altars are open. Amen. And oh, how.